European American. Welcome to this uh, European American seminar series on wind energy. Uh, we have been running since September and we have one seminar every month, the second Wednesday every month. And we have some available slots in the future. So if you have good ideas or want to say something, then you're welcome. Uh, and uh, now Sue will introduce today's speaker, Helena Pichugina. Yes. And thank you, Jakob. Uh, Dr. Yelena Puccinina is a senior scientist at the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Science series at the University of Colorado, affiliated with the Atmospheric Remote Sensing Group of the Chemical Sciences Lab at NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in Boulder, Colorado. She is involved in field projects related to air quality, wind energy, and wildfire. Her research focuses on applications of Doppler LIDAR measurements to study atmospheric processes in the boundary layer to quantify dynamic phenomena such as low-level jets, turbulence, and wind ramp events likely to present a risk to wind turbine operations. Uh, today, Yelena is going to be talking to us about mobile micro-Doppler LiDAR to support studies of wind flows around wind turbines. Yelena, the uh, floor is yours. Please share your screen. Thank you, Sue, for introduction. Um... So while Yelena is sharing the screen, I want to say that we usually have uh, questions last. But if you have some clarifying questions, then I think you are it's okay to uh, ask Yelena during the talk. Okay. Can you see the slide? It looks great. Okay. So do you see this black line in the bottom? Do I have to remove it or it's okay? No, it, we don't see that. You're, um, it, it looks just good now. Okay. So thank you for introduction. My name is Yelena Pichugina. And as you said, I'm working with a remote sensing group uh, in Boulder uh, more than 20 years. And I want to talk about uh, micro Doppler LiDAR that we use to support uh, many studies. And today about um, we'll talk about uh, measuring wind flows around wind turbines. And first of all, I want to acknowledge my um, uh, team of our engineers who develop LIDARs. We have many LIDARs uh, stationary, uh, like 200S, Halo. We have our zone LIDAR. But last five, six years, our engineers developed this uh, micro Doppler LIDARs. And in the bottom, you can see a um, facility in Boulder. And our group uh, located in the third floor here. And you see here is a porch. And sometimes there is a LIDARs going through test or do, going through different uh, comparison. We also have some C uh, LIDARs in containers. So um, mobile Doppler uh, systems. I have this. Uh, it's a motion stabilized compact system, they can operate from different platforms. And in the middle, you can see those pictures, um, ground-based system, aircraft-based system, and ship-based system. But to make uh, measurements from a moving platform, all those systems uh, have a motion compensation and also pointing stabilization. Our motion compensation allowed us to calculate and remove platform motions projected into line of sight velocity that we do measure in real time. Uh, how to remove this black line, if anyone knows, in the bottom? Yelena, yeah, we don't see a black line. It looks perfect okay. from us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> pointing stabilization allowed to measure platform orientation and also stabilized the orientation of the LiDAR beam in the world frame. So doesn't, pre okay. Um, what we have uh, to uh, improve design, actually we have right now third uh, modification of micro Doppler LiDARs. 
and in, it's improved and optimized for operation from any mobile platform because it's uh, have a, a smaller size. And the biggest achievement, the optical head shown here and instrument half rack, they separated. So they can be installed in any uh, space, especially this is important for small aircraft where there are not much space. And uh, as you know, usually the uh, experiment carry not only LIDAR, but other instrumentations. So. Here's some information about optical head. It's about two, three inches diameter ref, uh, refractive telescopes. Um, and it transmits and receives optics. So it's easy to position and also stabilize. Instrument half rack um, has um, uh, contain la uh, laser source and optoelectronics. And it's um, also has computer for real time analysis and also send data to website and also small footprints and lower power consumption. You can see all the technical parameters in this table, electrical power about 300 Watts and um, pulse energy is 50 millijoule. And in the bottom, you can see that it's weight less than 100 pounds. So hard to proceed. Why it doesn't proceed? Hmm. Okay. So here is the some uh, information on our um, scanner, uh, opto -me mechanical system com that combine this micro Doppler uh, lidar. Here in the right, uh, left, you can see a scanner that was developed by our engineers, and it's uh, has. 0, 0.0 degree azimuth precision, and also it can rotate very rapidly, like 60 degree in 20 milliseconds. A motion stabilization platform shown here on the porch of uh, our building uh, was designed uh, together with our engineers and also CU engineering team. And it can um, stabilize uh, motions up to 0.2 degree in RMS. And it's designed to be on a truck or uh, aircraft and then uh, set up on a truck shown here in the bottom. So this um, sketch show measurements from all of those platforms. And you can see that um, uh, LiDAR provide simultaneous measurements of uh, vertical, vertically steering beam at 90 degree and also scanning plus minus 15 uh, degree from Zenith. In the ship, same on a uh, truck, but um, recent truck modification include that we can turn this in any angle and do like RHI scans around a wind turbine. Um, airborne modification, here it's shown old modification when we did only measurements looking down. Now when a scanner uh, just go outside of the aircraft, we can look up and down, up and down. And in the bottom, you can see ship borne and track uh, borne modification of um, stabilization platform. Here is an example of how it, uh, data stabilized. And it, this simple uh, example from our uh, ship borne measurements that we did in the Western Atlantic. Uh, on the left side, you can see those uh, blue it's a ship motions shown in blue colors. And black, it's a stabilized motion of LIDAR, very narrow peak. So and in a angle, uh, in a uh, corner, you can see that unstabilized uh, standard deviation, it's 1.17, but stabilized very uh, much lower, it's 0.03. Uh, so, and this shown for the motions for pitch in the top, and for roll in the bottom, the same blue, it's um, ship motions and black, it's um, LIDAR. In a, on a ship, we also have heave motions and uh, corrected variances. Uh, we removed uh, about 0.2 meter, meter square per second square from the uh, platform motions to calculate variance profiles. Overall, we have... Um, uh, a, <laughs> Air, uh, accuracy due to 
pointing stabilization uh, with pre uh, obtained data with precision point 06 RMS and with accuracy 0.15 degree. Due to motion compensation, we can calculate any both platform motions uh, with error 1, 2 degree in pitch and roll and 1, 2 meters per second in the heave. So in other words, when we do those measurements of vertical velocity, this vertical velocity not mixed with the horizontal wind in those variations. So uh, we use uh, this, uh, those LIDARs for many years. And here's a table, not many, uh, during the last five years at least. And this table uh, show that uh, how we use it for different projects to investigate spatial temporal evolution of regional complex flow and also aerosol distributions. And in this uh, table, you can see that in some experiments, we use only shipborne or aircraft borne uh, modifications or track modifications. Sometimes we use uh, two uh, LIDARs, uh, two uh, platforms, aircraft and track, especially we did it to study wildfires in uh, California and Oregon. And today, uh, uh, here is the list of major research areas. And we, of course, concentrated as a chemical uh, lab, uh, chemical science lab, we concentrate on the air quality, wildfire dynamic, but also we use uh, for the wind uh, flow studies. And we participated last year in an American Wake experiment highlighted here in yellow uh, that was in central Oklahoma. But before this experiment, we did plenty of tests uh, around wind uh, farms in Colorado. And it's also yellow, but lighter color. You can see in 2023, 21, and 2020, we were driving there and testing uh, LIDAR, testing scanning and driving strategy uh, and everything what we can and uh, developing and preparing for the awakening. Uh, we call the latest modification that we have right now, we call pickup based mobile atmospheric sounder or PUMAS. And this picture show what we have on this uh, track uh, based LIDAR. Here's the motion stabilization fr frame LIDAR head. We have all sky camera. We can measure uh, temperature and wind in situ. Uh, LIDAR rack, it's in the back of the cabin and shown also here. Uh, in the front of the cabin, there is a real time display also shown here. Usually when we're driving somewhere, uh, we have two people, one is driving and another one, uh, usually it's scientists, look on the uh, data, look what is going on, can make decision to change uh, driving path to change if wind direction changes, to change uh, scanning, for example, to do RHI uh, around wind turbine or something. If there is, and also we monitor how our stabilization is going on. If there is any problems, we can connect with the office in Boulder. There is a, usually someone on call. Usually it's Alan Brewer who knows everything about everything. So, and he can just interrupt and do his magic and instrument will work again. Uh, here is a measurement characteristics. Uh, as I said, we can do continuous measurements and uh, car, uh, truck can um, drive any on highways and also dirt roads. And here uh, uh, it's shown two um, motion stabilized uh, LIDAR beams. One is vertically pointed and another one conically scanning. And it provides, as I said already, simultaneous profiles of horizontal wind vector, vertical wind speed and tur turbulence and aerosol backscatter. And I repeated it because it's very important. It's simultaneous profiles, not like uh, we had uh, other LIDAR stationary we have uh, first uh, horizontal winds, then vertical, horizontal and vertical. Here we can get, get it at once. So profiles go from 60 meter above ground to the top of boundary layer and with temporal resolution of one, four hertz. Uh, 
Along beam resolutions, along the line of sight velocity, it's 30 meters. Along pass, uh, wind profile resolution is 300, 600 meters. Along pass, W profile resolution is 10, 30 meters. And it's uh, range, range is given here because uh, along pass resolution depends on a driving speed. And on highways, uh, especially if it's busy highways, we cannot drive less than 50 miles sometimes on a back roads we can drive 20 miles or 10 miles when we do the rechise. Uh, here's an example of some uh, uh, a test in uh, Colorado that we did several times. Um, obtain information on system performance, as I said already, measurement errors and driving strategies. In this map, you can see where we were driving. So Boulder is here. Sometimes we went to Sterling. Uh, it's 225 kilometers from Boulder or to Lyman. There is plenty of wind uh, farms, and it's allowed us to do measurements for different wind directions. For example, if there is a uh, winds uh, going from, for example, from north, we can drive this pass I-70 and do uh, this pass. It's not influenced by wind turbines and turbines and this uh, part of the road influenced by wind turbine. Or sometimes we just did this pass along this road to measure influence flow. And in perpendicular, we did uh, measurements of not influence flow is if winds easterly or southeasterly. Here you can see uh, uh, curtains of velo vertical velocity shown from minus five to five meters per second. Here is turbines and it show uh, upward downward motions uh, of thermal plums. So it's interesting to analyze. Uh, in the bottom, uh, you can see uh, profiles of wind speed in colors in wind direction uh, uh, in a rows. Um, profile shown up to 1.5 kilometers because each uh, uh, post, um, black one, uh, horizontal post, uh, represents uh, 500 meters. So uh, for this particular case, wind speeds vary uh, southerly in up to 12 meters per second. So here to give you impression of what we had in Sterling, I will try to show a movie. Can you hear the sound? It's back. Okay. So this is truck, and um, you can see terrain. It's no, no terrain and almost flat. Sometimes you see slight terrain. But this example for evening. Um, so turbines operate very well because we speed about 10, 12 meters per second. And it's a little bit dark, but roads there are sometimes the most. So probably we cannot go there. And if you will take a look sometime, you can see how the scanning uh, civilization platform is moving, but not much because you see there is terrain and it's close uh, road. In the night, we can see those lights on turbines and can judge this. For example, this turbine doesn't work. There is no lights and, and next one. So sometimes turbines do not work. I don't know with a reason why. So as I said, we participated in Awaking. Awaking is the US Department of Energy project uh, led by National Renewable Energy Lab. This is a big project, uh, uh, plenty of organization involved, including ICU uh, Boulder. Uh, it's a long-term uh, campaign uh, from 21 to 23. And the main objective of the study was to understand interaction between wind turbine and environment surrounding them, and also to improve the performance of wake models. On this map, you see by black dots, it's a wind farms, different wind farms in this area. It's North Oklahoma. I highlighted uh, King uh, Plains wind farm that was uh, our interest. During awakening, there is plenty of instruments very deployed into this area. And you can see only uh, even uh, scanning LIDARs, uh, 13. There are very profiling LIDARs. There was two X-band uh, radars that covered uh, from uh, 
this side and from this side, they cover it almost all the area. So in addition to long-term uh, data from all those instruments in a table, we have short-term measurements from our mobile LIDAR Pumas, and also around months, a little bit longer, uh, there was uh, flights from a German DLAP aircraft. They also did measurements covering all this area. Also, uh, there is a long-term measurement from ARM SGP sites and all those uh, facilities uh, of the atmospheric radiation measurements ARM Southern Great Plains uh, facilities shown here by red points and you see here, and usually they heavily instrumented, especially this central facility, C1. So all those data set show us, uh, will be used to analyze and uh, I think results will be great. It's analysis already is going and plenty of some of papers already published, but there is plenty of thing to do. And if you want to know more about awakening, I put here a link. You can go there and read about, the, about this. So here's an example of measurements during awakening. We operated Pumas to provide motion compensated measurements of wind flow and turbulence about around wind turbines. So this Puma again, sometimes I think during our experiment, it's uh, two days very low due to heavy rain. And Puma was uh, sitting here uh, as shown here and close to the hotel uh, parking lot. A uh, couple of times we had flat tires. Uh, you mentioned it's a uh, dirt rose and it's uh, then occupied. There is a um, oil and gas facilities. People is living there. There is some agriculture. So people driving around those roads and everything could happen. Uh, this um, example of um, uh, together uh, curtains of uh, uh, vertical velocity from minus five to five and also profiles and it's shown up to one kilometer of wind profiles and uh, wind direction so it's just example how we can uh, have data and look on them um, during awakening uh, we did plenty of measurements and all those red uh, points show puma drives are, uh, along those roads and we were located in a city called Enid. For each road, transects were repeated several times during four or five hours of our measurements every day. And you can see all the um, distances here. So what we did, we tried to uh, use those data to characterize dynamic uh, flow. Uh, we also tried to see for signature of wake in uh, W variances and uh, 3D wind profiles. And also we look uh, how uh, wind uh, waked, wake change from the distances from turbine rows. And for each uh, drive, for each day, we look, uh, uh, the pre previous uh, day, we look on all forecast available and um, uh, very uh, thinking about optimal driving. For example, if winds are southerly, we were driving all those uh, horizontal uh, roads. If winds are easterly, we mostly drive on the vertical roads. So, and uh, every time uh, we have these maps, uh, like automatically uh, our driving passes as a log, they were sent to Boulder as a log file, and later we can know where we were driving. So here are some statistics uh, about those measurements. Uh, as I said, we did uh, measurements uh, from in August, about months, uh, but all, all only 20 days uh, were the good measurements were taken due to uh, reasons I already mentioned. But anyway, we have huge number of profiles that we are analyzing. Wind rows show uh, distributions of wind uh, winds during our experiments. And you can see here the mostly easterly or southeasterly winds, but uh, this uh, particular uh, site uh, characterized uh, mostly by southerly winds. It just for us, we did not see. Uh, much uh, southerly winds. Uh, this plot show uh, distribution of our measurements uh, by hours. And you can see that mostly we did measurements between six and 12 uh, local time. Of course, we're very interested in uh, early morning or evening transition hours, but unfortunately to us, 
uh, winds in the evening and morning very low. I, uh, <laughs> it's very strange to for me. So here is a, an example um, from um, nearby uh, Woodridge um, Airport forecast, and they call it uh, Ibert's uh, level. So, and you can see even here that for early morning uh, winds about two, three meters per second. So there, there is no sense to go early and do some measurements because turbine will not work um, hard. And that's why we mostly work uh, from seven to 14. And um, we did some, of course we drive through some uh, uh, roads, but also we did measurements in stationary positions sometimes uh, to be able to compare with uh, other awakened instrumentation measurements. Uh, some uh, measurements on several days we did try to do earlier around 7 a.m. to other lab with the lab aircraft. They were flying there from 6 to 10. Uh, sometimes and uh, covering larger area, but uh, I will show one example later. So here is the Google Earth uh, uh, view uh, on uh, drives uh, on our wind profile profiles along some roads, and uh, I just turn it slightly to better for better view. North now is there, and you can see C1 facility, uh, winds very south southeasterly. So you can see that, uh, and of course it's not uh, uh, shown for each uh, transect, just for several for better view. Otherwise, it will be so busy, and you can see that uh, within a uh, wind farm farm and close to the roads, uh, uh, turbines, uh, winds uh, are lower, about five, six meters per second. Then further, it's uh, slightly increased. And especially uh, strong winds here in, in this, uh, you don't uh, see that it's uh, not influenced by uh, wind turbines. But believe me, it's very far from wind farm, close to any, even past to any. So in winds, there are about 10, 12 meters per second compared to five, six. Uh, waked flow. Uh, here's an example how we uh, can get uh, 3D winds and W curtains. We can analyze them separately or uh, together. And here's an example for part of um, our transect on Breckenridge Road. So this in the top, you can see profiles of wind speed and wind directions. Uh, and um, they show from zero to 30 meters per second. So sometimes we can, you can see here evidence of low level jet and they are relatively strong about 25 meters per second. Uh, and the bottom uh, winds are lower and sometimes uh, it's up to five or even less. The middle plot show curtains of vertical velocity. And here we also see some structure, updraft, downdrafts, and it's driven by convection, some periods of increased turbulence like shown here, uh, and uh, small uh, the increase and decrease, increase and decrease and so on. And in the bottom, you can see other lab of a cur a W curtain and wind speed profiles. And it's shown slightly, it's just 180 degree uh, moved because uh, those turbines now behind so it's looking on the south, and I did it especially to just for better view of how those uh, profiles overlap. Here's an example uh, for September seven: uh, how we, what parts we consider as a uh, waked flow, like show in shown in black, uh, blue. Uh, this part of the road we consider. Um, uh, blocked or waked flow for the southeasterly winds, and a part of the road shown in magenta we consider free flow. So we can then compare um, mean wind profiles or time height cross sections for each of those um, parts to see uh, what the influence of wake, and we can do it for each uh, road. So uh, this example show time height cross sections 
for the part on uh, driving on Highway 412. And again, some part here we consider uh, influence because for southeastern winds, everything was influenced by wind turbine. We also considered a close wake or far wakes, but here is just for waked flow and very small, tiny part of not waked flow. And it's reflected in uh, wind speed. Uh, wind speed here average of one minute to reduce impact of strong turbulence. And you can see for the uh, waked flow, it's a lower winds and uh, much stronger about uh, 10, 12 meters per second for free flow. Uh, wind directions are mostly uh, southeasterly, but change uh, direction above 500 or 700 meters more to southwesterly. Profiles of uh, W shown for every 20 seconds, and you see uh, very strong updrafts below 500 meters. And um, uh, signal to noise ratio or SNR was uh, stronger below 500 meters. So this plenty of information to analyze in the future. Uh, we also look uh, uh, how wind uh, change from this distance. So here are the, uh, approximately the same length of parts we look on those and shown by red. So we call this SP, I don't know why SP, it's like speed uh, on the road 17, 20, and so on. And we compare them. And those comparisons shown on the right, you can see that uh, winds within uh, over uh, transect SP17 much lower compared to, for example, transect SP30 that's slightly far, maybe several kilometers further from uh, turbine turbines. Uh, while wind directions for all those are uh, uh, approximate uh, in a lower level uh, the same. Uh, as I said previously, sometimes we did measurements in uh, stationary positions. Actually, we did five minutes uh, stop uh, stationary measurements at the beginning of each transect going down and again, five minutes stop and going up and again, five minutes stop. And we did it for a future just to take those stationary measurements and compare with mobile LIDAR to see if there is any error. But sometimes we stop for longer period, like uh, this example shows we were sitting here in site H close to the other uh, LIDARs. Here's the uh, halo scanning LIDAR on Citainer and also Zephyr profiling LIDAR. And we were sitting there about two hours and this um, show all profiles together for those two hours. And you can see uh, how different, there is some variability even primarily uh, or uh, winds very uh, in one direction, but still for two hours, we, we saw plenty of changes. And in the bottom, you can see some comparison. Black lines show halo measurements at 90 meters. It's 10 minute measurements. Uh, red, it's uh, Puma's 20 second measurements and the closest height, 104 meters. And a uh, blue points show uh, Puma's uh, data average over 10 minutes. Uh, and the, another closest height from Pumas is 78 meters. It, uh, the next plot showed just uh, 20 seconds data from Pumas at 70 and 104. They do not uh, uh, have huge difference. So looking on those uh, plot, we concluded for this particular uh, sample, we have a good agreement between hub heights wind from stationary halo and Puma measurements. As I said, sometimes we, uh, not sometimes, but always we look on parts uh, waked and uh, free flow and compare it. And here is a, you can see some uh, uh, samples where the black line show free flows and red it's a waked. Sometimes we see uh, some significant difference between those, uh, like shown in first two uh, plots. Sometimes there is not much difference. Uh, probably it's high due to high variability of winds.
And another uh, example here also not much variability uh, difference between uh, free and wake flow shown here for this transect when we very driving through highway 412 and this part we consider free and this part we consider wake flow and you see the, there is not much difference uh, some difference but uh, this uh, difference between wake and free flow uh, within the uncertainty uh, the third panel show RW variance profiles when we took differences, maybe some evidence of a, a slightly increased W variance um, for the waked flow. As I said uh, previously, we had um, some overlap uh, with uh, dial-up aircraft flights. Here you can see in magenta the track of the flight uh, flights for this day on September 5th. And red, it's shown um, just uh, transect uh, from Pumas. And I see, I, I think that uh, we can later compare uh, data from transect A, B, and C with uh, what we can get from the aircraft measurements. Overall, for this uh, day, uh, time height cross-sections of wind speed in wind direction shown here. And you can see that the winds were relatively strong, about 25 meters in the morning, uh, morning and then they deceased. Uh, we observed uh, wind directions were mostly um, southeasterly, but we observed some periods of um, southerly measurement, uh, southerly winds, and those changes uh, coincide with the decrease of wind speed. Uh, we decided to take a detailed look on this particular case, thinking maybe it's uh, flow, wind flow instability. And here's my conclusions. Awakening data set demonstrated capability of mobile LIDAR system, the Cummins spatial variability on wind flows at different distances uh, within wind farms and from wind farms. Uh, high frequency um, measurements, simultaneous measurements of wind speed direction and also uh, w, w velocity uh, provide new approach for characterization of dynamic processes around wind farms. Right now in future directions, right now our team uh, working on development full hemispherical scanning uh, capability. And we're also working on improving the sampling strategies to maximize uh, synergy between two uh, LIDARs, ground-based and aircraft and uh, base LIDAR. And we're doing this mostly for um, wildfire studies, but I think it will also benefit wind energy studies if there is any other uh, project we will participate. So, and we, we definitely will use our data uh, together with data from other instruments and maybe from the HDP sites to better estimate spatial temporal structure of wakes. And here, uh, another video, I wanna show you this now, it's an, in Oklahoma and in it where we're very located. I hope you can see the sound. This is Puma and you see all instrumentation in the back. This particular road is not bad, it's a peony road. But winds not very uh, strong, about four meters per second, so turbines do not move fast, uh, they a little bit slow. Uh, stationary measurement, measurements and stationary position. So thank you for your attention. And this is interesting picture, show the two uh, <laughs> energy sources wind energy and oil energy. Thank you very much. I'm ready for questions. Thank you very much, Yelena. Thank you, Yelena. Um, excellent seminar. And you can see the virtual applause. Um, we're willing to take questions. Julie, looks like you have one. 
Yeah, thanks, Elena, for a, a really nice talk. This is a great capability. And can you turn off the speaker over there? Uh, this is a really great capability, and I'm looking forward to the, the data analysis that's going to be coming out from this. So I know that you were focusing mostly on looking at the winds to quantify wind turbine wakes, but you had also mentioned pretty early on that you can see to the top of the boundary layer with Puma, and I was wondering if you had seen any evidence of variability of boundary layer height um, from the Puma measurements. Is that going to be something that you guys will be looking at in the future? We will look because we have already engine to compute, uh, to calculate boundary layer from LIDAR measurements, and it was um, done by Tim Boning probably in 2017. And since then we use this technique, but honestly, I did not take a look yet because if you remember this, uh, table we, we just jumping from one experiment to another <laughs> so, no, no, no. Uh, I, I, under, I understand i wasn't saying that you, that you should have already done that i was just wondering if that was on your list no 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 but it's on our list to do detailed analysis and i think uh february march will be a perfect month uh, before our next uh experiment so uh, we're going to do this and I'm going to connect with you also with the uh, person who handled this Zephyr, I think it's Sonia, uh, to use the, her data with Leticia on about Halo data. Uh, we did some measurements uh, sitting uh, a lot, uh, along the CR40, uh, going a little bit down highway, and there is a plenty of other instrumentation. I did not check yet, but I know there is a LiDAR on nacelle and other instruments, so we can... Uh, and I did not connect it, yes, with the lab uh, folks, so maybe we can share our data and do some analysis. But there is a plenty of stuff to do, and I, of course, hope that you, Julie, with your students will help. <laughs> Very happy to help. Thanks. It's a really exciting data set. And Elias, you have a question? Yes. Hi. Um, thanks, Yelena. That was super interesting. I, I can think of a lot of cool applications for the technology. Um, and I have like two questions about the system itself. So the first one is, um, you talked about the pitch and roll and the heave compensation, but is that does that mean there's nothing for the yaw? I mean, because I, I don't know um, if your system has like a, a scan head that can position also azimuth. Uh, I, like, is that why you're doing the straight transects? Uh, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, we don't have those yaw. We just when we're driving, we have the pitch in. Uh, role control uh, for what uh, we need some um, correction for vertical velo velocity measurement, right? We need to know how uh, it's declined from Nadir. So, and it's allowed us to look in a world frame and see how, if there is a more than one, two uh, degree, we can change as I showed you on a sitting in a uh, front of this panel, there is an ability to stop and start over and change this um, error. And it will, we always keep eyes that it should be less than point something. So uh, for the yo, I, I cannot tell anything. For the role, we also have this uh, because, you know, we need to know exactly what the vertical or horizontal uh, uh, beam how it looks and uh, pointing stabilization uh, allowed us to do this keeping any azimuth what we want okay so, so I can with, see that. yeah i can see actually you car. can you can connect to alan brewer who knows everything about this instrument he designed it from the scratch and so most knowledgeable people okay no thank you for that um i was wondering too are what kind of like um, supporting sensors do you need for this? Because I, I imagine you'll need to have like a, a differential GPS and inclinometer, yeah. all of this. Yes, absolutely. There's a C in a U system because you want to know how in the world frame is located. Yes, there is more, more systems. And uh, of course uh, we use the uh, LIDAR measurements on a ship 
even in 2004 during HEAC's experiment, and we did some measurements and we had motion compensation system, but everything was so big. Uh, LIDAR was in container. Of course, for the ship, it's not a big deal, but for aircraft, it's a big deal. And when we publish our papers, I think several papers went uh, in 2017 out of those um, data sets. So it was, uh, it was great interest. Since then, our engineers start to work with a CU team to develop this uh, small uh, motion compensation technique. And it was huge work and a huge advantage that they can put it in any platform and then drive and don't worry about a road, don't worry about all those motions, uh, this system will do everything, so. Excellent, yeah, thank you for that and, and for sharing your work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Yil and I was really fascinated with your comparison of free and weight, I think it was on slide 20. Um, could you give us a little bit more information about you know, what was the averaging time on each? I was a little bit confused precisely where you were on, on getting the free versus the weight um, version for the comparison. Um, Here, right? Uh, I, I was looking at the yeah, I was actually looking at the one, this one. The red one where you actually red had the profiles. profiles. Yeah. Ah, profiles, okay. Yeah, I thought that was fascinating. Oh. This, those yeah. ones? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, what, what was the averaging time and where were you for each? The averaging time, it was um, shown here on the top of each panel, for example. Uh, for example, okay. for yeah, for this one, you can see it's about 14 minutes, right? From mm -hmm. 10 to 16.24 UTC. And uh, it's also on Highway 35, and it's a show south, uh, we're going south or we're going north. Uh, it's on, also uh, in the top. But uh, when we're going south, uh, for those winds, we have part no, I don't remember what the uh, south southwesterly winds. So for some part we have, um, I did not indicate at which part, but we have some blocked winds and some um, free. Of course, they hard to say it's free because there is another wind farm, but I think the rain and distance allowed us to think it's a free. Mm -hmm. And this is the biggest problem for us to look uh, for the differences in how to consider terrain. Because as you can see here, some, you know, uh, a river or whatever, and there is a some terrain. So, and it's also can influence flow. Okay, so it's complicated. It's very complicated. Now you're working on a technique to uh, compare not by path or by part of roads, but look on each turbine, we know a uh, lot long of each turbine, we know a lot long of uh, each uh, point of measurements, and we know wind speed and wind direction in each point of measurements. So looking on direction in this point, we can compute or think about weight, it's or not weight. It's a little bit complicated, but we're going to towards this direction to do more accurate estimate of weight and free flow. Mm -hmm. Okay, really interesting. Um, and is this, you mentioned sharing your data. Um, are you planning to share it widely or should people ask you if they're interested in analyzing data? We were talking about this with uh, Alan who is uh, working with data. So yes, we're planning to put it on a DAP very soon. Okay. Yes, we'll finish all those uh, experiments. Uh, we have some date, um, some experiments where people paying us and asking <laughs> for results so fast. <laughs> it's slightly different from NREL. But we're planning to put there and we're ready to send data to anyone who will ask. 
we have those uh, uh, actually we can share our uh, link to our um, NOAA website where we have those data so you click on a date and you can go there great any other questions Okay, I think um, I thank everybody for attending. As Jakob mentioned at the beginning, we still have an opening in May. Um, if anybody on the call would like to volunteer for the May sem seminar, um, you know, we're looking for volunteers. Um, but let's thank Yelena again. Thank you. See you. Thank I you just want to mention. If you guys will go here, uh, use this link, uh, measurements, and then you can see name of each experiment and you will go to Awaken and there is a website uh, kind of describe what we did. Uh, I did not put the um, real data yet because we have to go through each and look, but at least you can read what we did and more information there. Can I stop sharing? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So thank you again and thank the entire audience and see you next month um, for our next installment. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.